So hello, I'm Julius Krabacek, that's this thing here. And I'm in a lab called, that was previously called PPS and now is called IRIF, and at a university that was previously called the University of Paris 7, and now is called the University of Paris Diderot. But don't get used to it, because we're going to be renamed really soon, right now. And I don't see the whole of my slide here. I don't know, I'm going to try to reduce it. Yeah, that's better, because the screen. And uh, this thing is the logo of the Babel routing protocol, which I'm going to tell you about today. And this logo was done by a member of the community whose pseudonym is R404, and I don't see him today, unfortunately. So what's the story? Hmm? No, l'écran est plus grand. Essaye. Perfect, thanks a lot. So the story starts in 2006. I guess that most of you were children at the time or something. And at the time we were really excited by mesh networks. And uh, there was a big, big problem on, uh, in our lab, which was that the PhD students didn't have Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi didn't reach. Uh, on the couch of the PhD students. So you have to know that in France, in universities, it is illegal to have a couch in your office, because obviously if there are no couches, there will be no sexual harassment. So I remember that the PhD students brought the couch into their office by night, on, a, on the night between Saturday and Sunday, and hid it carefully behind a steel cabinet. And the result was that the Wi-Fi didn't reach the couch which obviously makes the couch completely pointless. What's the point of having a couch in your office if you cannot access the internet? And at the time, I had just learned about mesh networks. And so what I did was to buy three home routers, the nice white ACES boxes that some of you might remember. Um, I reflashed them under OpenWRT, and then I bought a bottle of whiskey and went to speak to with our uh, administrator. So I always wonder how people who don't drink manage to get things done. According to me, that's completely impossible. And so after drinking a large part of the bottle of whiskey, he gave me the right to use one Ethernet jack, but the Ethernet jack was in the conference room. And the topology was such that the conference room is somewhere down there, and reaching the couch was difficult. And so I installed OLSR, and I decided to set up an IPv6-only OLSR network to get Wi-Fi, thinking that that will force our students to use IPv6. And it sort of worked, but not really very well. So first of all, OLSR, I know about ETX, OLSR, uses shortest hop routing. And shortest hop routing is worst path routing. You all know that. I'm not going to explain it again. Everyone here, just ask your neighbor if you don't know what I'm speaking about. The implementation of OLSR that I was using at the time had some bugs. And it wasn't clearing routing loops fast enough. And it was had completely buggy support for IPv6. So of course, somebody reasonable would have simply fixed the bugs in the implementation of OLSR. But I wouldn't be doing, I wouldn't be a lecturer if I were somebody reasonable. I'd be doing something reasonable like making money in a private company. And therefore, instead of doing the reasonable thing, I designed Babel. And there is a proverb in academia that says that six months of research can save you half an hour in the library. In this case, it has been 12 years of research. OK, before I tell the rest of the story, hi, Dave, it's so good to see you. Um, before I keep telling the story, I have to tell you about a place where Dave got me, and I, don't, I still haven't forgiven you, Dave, the ATF. So uh, I guess that most of you know what the ATF is. Out of curiosity, who knows what the ATF is? Please raise your hand. OK. <laughs> so the ITF is officially the organization in charge of the internet standards, everything about la above layer three. Layer two, that's the IEEE. And 
the ITF, so that's an ITF plenary, that's a place where everyone is looking at their laptop because it's really boring. The actual work happens in small groups, but the plenary looks nice, so that's why I put the picture. And the ITF produces documents that are known as a request for comments but they're actually not requests for comments. It's too late to comment once it's published as an RFC. And there are many kinds, but basically there are two. There are standards, and we call them standard track documents, and non-standards, and those can be informational, experimental, there's a whole variety, but it doesn't matter. The important distinction is ex uh, standard or non-standard. Now back to my story. So when I did Babel, I wrote it down, because that's my job, to write stuff down. And so I wrote it down in great detail, and then Bob Hinden contacted me and said that would make a nice RFC. So I spent six months answering to reviewers, and at the time I thought it was a lot, getting it published as an experimental RFC, which came out in 2011. And in 2015, we had a minor war at IETF, basically not Vietnam War scale, something just a little bit more modest. And after the small war, we won, and the HomeNet working group at ITF decided that it would depend on Babel. And here, big, big administrative problem. Babel is not an ITF standard. How can an ITF standard depend on a non-ITF standard? So we ended up in a bar with all sorts of important people. Some people said, but we can make an exception. Some people said, no, we won't make any exceptions because I'm the boss here, because ITF is really democratic. AA, initials AA. And uh, at which point, they encouraged me to agree to work together with the ITF on making Babel an ITF standard. And I thought, that's easy, we already have a ready protocol, we have a ready document, we take the document, we proofread it, we put the ITF stamp, and in 2019, that was 2015, we're almost ready to publish. Cross fingers. Right now, I'm going, how, I have half an hour, right? Okay, so I'm going to take 10 minutes, the slides say 15, but I'm going to take just 10 minutes to tell you a bit, little bit about the technology behind a Babel. So if you hate mathematical formulas, just, you know, think about something pleasant. Okay, now you can stay, Dave, just think about something else. So think about something pleasant, and I'm going to say. So, technical summary, Babel is a loop-avoiding distance vector protocol. Distance vector protocol means like RIP, and loop avoiding means without the problems that RIP has. And uh, since I'm a scientist, I started by having a correctness argument for Babel, and then I designed the protocol around the correctness argument, and found out what is the set of axioms that a network has to satisfy. So I don't say that Babel works on this kind of networks. I say, here are the conditions that your network needs to satisfy for Babel to work on it. There is a bunch of those. Those are the most important. So the most important is causality. Causality says that if you send a message, the message is not received before it was sent. It doesn't say that messages arrive in order. It doesn't say anything like that. It just says that a message never arrives before it has been sent. If you like technical formulae, it means that the happens before relation is acyclic. Okay, if you have a network that is not causal, I would like to have a look at it, because that could be <laughs> interesting. There are some other axioms that are a little bit more technical. And uh, so we have a number of well-defined and fairly weak assumptions about the network and the metric we're using. And this has some very important conse consequences. It makes Babel easy to understand, because you know what you're assuming, you know what you're trying to make work. It takes about 20 minutes to understand the principles behind Babel, it takes about 45 minutes to fully understand the protocol. Okay, I'm trying, to, I'm trying right now to do it in 10 minutes, we'll see whether I manage. It's easy to implement, so the record right now is Marcus Stenberg, who did it in two nights at a conference. Okay, and I would like to also mention Toke Heuland Jorgensen, who is the guy, the partner in crime of this gentleman here. Have you heard of the buffer bloat? 
project, okay, it's him and another guy. And Toki is the other guy. You'll remember him because he is the, the person with the most slashed O's in his name that I've ever met. And Toki did it in five days during Battle Mesh. Okay, that is something of an achievement, and that's, I think, the best implementation of Babel. It's better than my implementation. It's robust. It's robust because you've built a network, and you know how networks. You start your network thinking, oh my, it's going to be really well designed and clean, not like the other networks. And then the network grows organically, and suddenly you find out it's a mess. Well, even though your network is a mess, it probably doesn't violate causality and the other properties we have. So it has a good chance of making Babel work. And it's extensible, because when you're extending something like OSPF or OLSR, you have to be very careful. What am I breaking? Well, in Babel, you know what the assumptions are. And as long as your extension doesn't violate those assumptions, then it has a very good chance of working. So it's a loop-avoiding distance vector protocol. It uses the distributed Bellman-Ford algorithm, which I'm going to describe in a second. And it has additional mechanisms that, evo that avoid loops because naive Bellman-Ford creates transient loops in the network. So people often, often think that things like OL OLSR or OSPF don't do routing loops. Here's an example of a routing, uh, of a routing loop in OLSR. So I have a very simple topology. I have two good links and one bad link. And so B is routing through A. Now S, now something happens. And all that I've changed is that the link from A to S, instead of being of metric one, now has metric five. Nothing else has changed. It started raining or whatever. Well, in this case, A is going to realize that the link to S is bad and root to B. But B doesn't know it yet before flooding has happened. And so B is still rooting through A. Bang, you've got a routing loop. It will go away as soon as the control traffic goes from A to B. But because your packets are going in a loop and you're on a radio link, well, the, the data packets going uh, in the loop are interfering with the propagation of your control. And so the loop is going to take some time to clear. Now, in Babel, that doesn't happen. In the same situation, A will wait. Things will happen in the right order. First, B will switch, then A will switch, and not the opposite. OK, distributed Bellman Ford. You know distributed Bellman Ford? So here we are interested in this topology. All the links have cost 1, and we are routing to S. Every node maintains two variables for every destination. One variable that says what is the estimated distance, and one variable that says through whom we route. Initially, everyone says, I don't know how to route to S. S routers knows that it's at distance zero. S announces to all of its neighbors, hey, guys, I'm at distance zero. So A goes, hey, I'm at distance infinity. If my neighbor is at distance zero, that means that by going through S, I can be at distance one. And so it installs a route through S and announces to its neighbors in turns, hey, guys, I'm at distance one. It doesn't say through, wh through what. It doesn't announce the route. There is no flooding. It just says, I'm at distance one now. And B and C go, hey, if A is at distance one, then we can be at distance two by going through A. Bang, we're done. We've converged in just two iterations. Time proportional to the diameter of the network. You cannot do any better. That's beautiful. We're done. The problem of routing is solved. Let's all go home. <laughs> That's the algorithm. And now something happens, and this link breaks. Somebody unplugs a cable. At some point, A will realize that it can no longer go through S. But then B still thinks it's a distance 2. Is it B? Yeah, it's B. So A goes, well, I can no longer go through S, but B is telling me he's at distance 2. And so A switches to B, says, now I'm at distance 3, going through B. So what's happening? A is sending its packets to B, B is sending its packets to A. And at some point, B goes, hey, A is no longer at distance 2, it's now at distance 3. 
I'll go through C. That's a better route. OK, we're going to keep increasing. You know how you go to a party and you say, hey, have you seen D Dave recently? Yeah, somebody told me he was go going fine. And then the same person will ask you, have you seen Dave recently? Yeah, somebody recently told me he was doing fine. And you keep exchanging the same information about Dave being fine, but you actually never confirm it with the source of the information. OK, I'm glad I see you there. And now we have actual data, concrete, provable data. I'm at distance one of Dave. And in this case, in this case, we have this kind of mutual deception going on between the different nodes. And the tragedy is that during this phase known as counting to infinity, we have a routing loop and therefore all of your radio bandwidth is saturated with the packets going round and round and round the loop. It will eventually clear. It will clear when the distance, which increases every time, reaches infinity. And the choice is to choose a small value of infinity. <laughs> okay. The slogan of distance vector protocols is good news travel fast, slow news travel forever. <sighs> so, that's the same algorithm that I've shown before, and I've just added the things in blue. Instead of announcing just the distance, I announce the distance with some additional data. And then I have a function called feasible. And feasible is an oracle. The oracle tells me this route doesn't have any loops. So I check with a third party with some fancy algorithm I'm not describing yet. And the algorithm tells me, look, that's a good route. It doesn't have any loops. And if everybody checks the condition, then there will be no loops in the network. And the only difficulty is designing the feasibility condition. And over the years, a lot of people have been doing feasibility. That's my terminology. And that's uh, n something that has been understood for a long time, but nobody actually formalized the fact that all of those algorithms are instances of the same meta-algorithm. BGP is a distance vector algorithm with a rather simple and brutal and efficient feasibility condition. DSDV, AODV use a feasibility condition that doesn't work really well. And in Babel, we use the feasibility condition stolen from a rather nice protocol, a Cisco protocol called EIGRP, which says, which is the following. So we define a new piece of data, the feasibility distance. And the feasibility distance is the minimum in the past of my metric. So my, my distance is the current metric, and the feasibility distance is the minimum over the past, the best metric I've ever had. And we say that a route is feasible if the distance that it announces is smaller than my feasibility. So the intuition here is pretty clear. Daniele, can you serve as a router for now? Daniele is announcing me a route, metric 35. And I need to know whether this metric 35 is the past trace of something that I announced and that Daniele is re-announcing to me, or whether he has a contact with the source. Well, the idea is that if what he's saying is better than what I've ever said in my life, then it cannot possibly be something that comes from me. Example. Same situation as before. 1, 2, 2, the metrics. Feasibility distance is 1, 2, 2. A loses its root, it switches to infinity, it cannot switch to B, because B is announcing 2, and 2 is not strictly less than 1. And we're done, the loop is broken. In time, proportional to the diameter of the network, you cannot do anything better. We've solved the problem of routing, we can go home. Where did I cheat? Yeah. The problem is that I'm throwing out too many routes. It is very easy to starve, to have good routes. So the feasibility condition is conservative. Sometimes you are going to have perfectly good routes that are not going to be feasible. 
Here's a simple topology. A and B are both routing directly to S, distance 1. The link between A and S breaks. A's feasibility distance is 1. B's distance is 1. A cannot switch to B because the route is not feasible, and the algorithm forbids it. And here we have the tragic situation in which our routers are sitting in front of a table laden with food, but just because they cannot prove that the food is not past its expiration date, they are starving. <laughs> we need to do something. So let's solve starvation. And what we do in Babel is that we use sequence routes. So every route is equipped with a datum that we call a sequence number. And the sequence number is a strictly increasing integer. And a route, we say that it's better than another one if either it is more recent, it has a higher sequence number, or it has a better metric. OK, so I always accept more recent routes, even if they are not feasible. The proof of correctness is exactly the same. Here's an example. S, same example as before, S is announcing a route with sequence number 1. OK, B and A have gone with sequence number 1, uh, received routes with sequence number 1, so their feasibility distances are sequence number 1, distance 1. OK, now this link breaks. A is not allowed to go through B because 1-1, one, one, uh, because 1-1, one, one, because 1-1 one, one is not strictly better than 1-1. One, one. So we have the same situation as earlier. But at some point, S decides to increase its sequence number. The new sequence number propagates to B, and at this point, A is allowed to accept this route because it's provably more recent than the bad route that it had before. And at this point, the uh, famine is solved. So the process slows down convergence because you have to wait for a new sequence number. OK, but it provably solves convergence. And the question is, when do we increase the sequence number? And so you need yet another mechanism to decide when to increase the sequence number. DSDV used a timer. S would increase its sequence number once every 15 seconds. So you'd be with your laptop, you would move 20 meters, and then your, lap your internet connection would freeze for up to 15, 20 seconds, depending on how fast the numbers propagated. It's not very sat satisfactory. So I looked at the problem for a long, long time, stared at it really badly until the point when I would wake up, you know, having dreamt of sequence numbers all night. Caleb here is going, yes, that's familiar. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at which point I realized that the mistake in DSDV is that the sequence number mechanism is used in order to solve a starvation at A. S has no way of knowing that A is starving. So we have the problem that the person who can increase the sequence number, who is S, and the person who needs the sequence, who knows that the sequence number increase is needed, A, are different entities in the network. So they need to communicate. And what we do in Babel is that we send an explicit message, except that the network is broken at this point, because we are starving. So you need a little bit of work to get this communication to work. OK, I don't think I have the time to tell you how I'm doing that. But shall we say that this is a part of the protocol that we've managed to solve in a relatively elegant and provably correct manner. It was badly broken at one point, and it was shown to be badly broken at Battle Mesh in Catalonia. I don't remember which number it was. Were you there? Battle Mesh 4. Yeah. Their Babel completely collapsed because this mechanism was buggy. There are other problems. First, you have multiple internet gateways, 
and with multiple internet gateways, you have a problem with sequence numbers, so you have to do some more work. And if you're not careful, you're going to have routing loops, so you have to do a little bit of more work. And then you have routes that cover each other. We don't only have host routes, we have network routes. And once you have network routes that cover each other, then you run the risk of having routing loops. And here the solution is something I'm really not happy with. And it was the mechanism is no longer compulsory in the standard track version of the protocol. How am I doing for time? Did I do my 10 minutes? Did you understand anything? <laughs> okay. So, back to my story. Remember at the beginning I told you the story that we're going to publish a, a routing protocol at the ITF and we're really happy that finally and so quickly after less than five years we are going to manage to publish it. And we had a big debate at the beginning. Some people thought that's a chance to do a clean slate, to redo Babel from scratch. Okay, I'm 45. Western Europe smoked for 12 years of his life. So I have, what, another 40 years life expectancy, probably, if I'm lucky. Okay, so no. Redoing something at IETF from, from scratch was just not a good idea. And some other people thought we must be strictly compatible with Babel. Don't touch anything. I have a Babel network. If you touch anything, my network will break and I have to go up trees in order to reflash my routers. And so we decided on a compromise. And we have made some substantial changes to the protocol, but all of them are optional. And if you don't use the new features, then you interoperate 100% with the old protocol. Plus, it's really easy and now I'm going to say uh, it's really easy to take an implementation and upgrade it. So Babel D 1.8.4 and BER 2.0 have been, have been upgraded to the new protocol. Babel D 1.9.0, which I'm going to release last week at the latest, does actually use the new features. And Laure, who is the young lady at the very back over there, has just done an internship with me. And the first week of the internship, the job was to upgrade FRR, another implementation of Babel, to the new standard. So when I say it's easy, it means that for somebody who is a competent programmer but has never seen the code before, it's something that is do doable a week, 10 days, something like that, right? OK, there are three changes. One, we can run, yeah? Yeah, we can. Uh, I'm, uh, Dave is saying that I'm lying. OK, but that's because he uses an extension to the protocol which has changed. The truth about the core protocol is the truth. We, I'll come back to that. That's a good point. So the changes from the experimental protocol is that now we can run over pure unicast that there are two mechanisms, mandatory sub-TLVs and the packet trailer, that make the protocol more extensible, things that we felt the need for with some experience. So, first point. Exper normal Babel uses a mixture of multicast and unicast for the control traffic. And some people want to run Babel over pure unicast. There are good reasons for that. There is Antonin, who is the gentleman over there, who likes to run Babel over DTLS. There are some other people who like to run Babel over WireGuard. OK, those are perfectly acceptable. Um, they're perfectly acceptable applications. And those protocols don't support multicast. And so in standard track Babel, we have different modes of operations. The default is to use a mixture of multicast and unicast, just like in the old version of Babel. You can use multicast for just for neighbor discovery, just for discovering your neighbors, and all the rest you can run over unicast, or you can run everything over unicast, in which case you are already know where, what are the IP addresses 
of your neighbors. You have to configure them statically in that case because you cannot have a discovery mechanism. That's the WireGuard case, where WireGuard does the discovery and you somehow push the information into Babel, who doesn't need to do its own discovery. <coughs> Mandatory sub-TLVs. So Babel is an extensible protocol. And extensible, the main mechanism is that a TLV, a piece of data in a Babel packet, if you don't understand it, you ignore it. I never heard you. You're speaking some strange foreign language. I haven't heard you. OK, and that works pr pretty well, except that TLVs can optionally contain sub-TLVs. And if you don't understand the sub-TLV, you throw out the sub-TLV, but you keep the enclosing TLV. And uh, the problem with that is that you cannot use a sub-TLV to add incompatible information. So what we've added in the standard track Babel is the ability to put a bit in the sub-TLV that says, look, if you don't understand the sub-TLV, then throw out the whole TLV that's inside. So to give you an analogy, I put a bit in every word that says, if you don't understand this word, please throw out the whole sentence because this word is not. And it changes completely the meaning of the sentence. OK, and that makes a lot of things much, much easier. From a theoretical point of view, it doesn't change anything. From a practical point of view, it simplifies the life of the extension developer dramatically. And third thing, we've added a packet trailer to Babel packets, and the packet trailer is used for cryptographic signature. Ten, five, seven, seven. Okay, exciting extensions. Delay-based metric. Where is, is Baptiste in the room? No. Designed by Baptiste Jonglès, who is the organizer of this battle mesh. Source-specific routing, which was done by Mathieu Boutier. HMAC security, which uses the packet trailer, which was done by two students who are not here, and DTLS security, which uses Babel over Unicast. And this guy is not the only person guilty for this extension, but he's, about, he's done way more than half the work. OK, I'm going to be very quick. Babel, by default, uses the ETX metric. ETX metric is pretty cool but ETX metric doesn't work in overlay networks. We want to run Babel in overlay networks, and we need to be able to distinguish the Lille-Paris-Marseille route from the Lille-Tokyo-Marseille route. And for that, you need some extra data. And so we are measuring the uh, packet delay. And so when you measure packet delay, you get a feedback loop. You are going to get oscillations. But we do control the oscillations. The frequency of the oscillations is about five minutes, and that's satisfactory. Source-specific routing. Source-specific routing is very exciting. Mesh networks should be aware of source-specific routing. Source-specific routing is a way to have a multi-homed network with no collaboration from the ISPs. Usually, in order to multi-home, you need to ask your ISPs to collaborate. And they will say, yeah, sure, no problem. 10,000 euros per month. OK, most of us do not want to pay 10,000 euros per month to Orange. So we don't. And we need techniques for multi-homing that require no collaboration. And that is what source-specific routing is about. But I'm going to skip it. And source-specific routing has been originally implemented by Mathieu Boutier back in 2013 and extensively reworked using mandatory sub-TLVs in Babel D1.9.0 using the new extension mechanism. And that caused a lot of grief to our friend Dave, who had to go up a number of trees to update all of his routers. But the technical advantages for us are so huge that we have taken the risk of uh, worsening our relations with Dave. I live. Your 
Secu security, I'll finish, I'll finish, I have uh, two slides left. Security, we have done plenty of exciting work on security. I mentioned Antonin, I have mentioned, um, I have mentioned the trailer mechanism, I have mentioned a lot of things. I'm not going to give you any details. That's compulsory for being at IETF. I'll tell you something. Forget about all the Babel security mechanisms. Just put WPA2 on all of your links. But that's not acceptable for IETF, because IETF want security at the application layer, at the, um, well, at the, at the IETF layers. And uh, uh, they are right for one reason. There is no such thing as Ethernet security. 802.1x is a lie, is a ripoff. OK, there is no way to secure an Ethernet if people have access to the Ethernet jacks. And therefore, they're right to require a security mechanism. We have two. They have different properties. They have different trade-offs. Thank you very much. And to everyone who has written to me, I promise, I promise I'm going to make a release really soon now. Thank you very much for your attention. Any question? I didn't really understand the point about sub TLVs and how much does it impact stuff. Also, be because my understanding is that you are not propagating any message in Babel, or are you? You're just like updates, they, they, they're not okay. propagated with their TLVs. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example that's easy to understand. Uh, suppose I'm announcing TOS routes. OK, so you have your, your community network. And what you want is that the community network does give priority to voice over YouTube CAD videos. So what your users do, and we're assuming here that all the users are trusted, they put a, t a bit in the packet header that says, this is voice. And so you carry the voice even though your network is drowned in YouTube CAD videos. And then you decide to announce a route over a good link that is only for carrying voice. And suppose that I'm announcing and saying this route is restricted to voice only. If you take the announcement, drop the restriction, you are going to push YouTube traffic through me. So with this information, I want to say, if you don't understand this piece of information, drop the whole update. And that's what the mandatory bit does. Uh, so basically, now I am the, the not updated router will actually save some added information to the route, and it will propagate this information even if it doesn't know what this information no. is. The non-updated router will ignore this route. So you have a default route that all the routers understand, a route specific to voice, and what you want is that the routers that don't understand TOS ignore the voice-specific route and push everything through the default route. Okay. And why, this? And why this needed sub-TLV? You already had TLVs that could yes, have Yes, but been then you would have one TLV for normal routes, one TLV for TOS-specific routes, one TLV for source-specific routes, one TLV for source-specific TLV TOS-specific routes, and you have an explosion of the number of different TLVs. Here you have individual pieces of data, and I'm allowed to say, this extra data you can throw out if you don't understand it, and this amount of data, if you don't understand it, throw out the whole route. Okay? So you can simulate it without mandatory bits by taking the Cartesian product of all the possibilities, but that's a mess. I don't have a question so much as three quick statements. One I is don't so believe you. What? I'm the quick bit. Source-specific routing is a wonderful way of building a fault-tolerant mesh network. And if you aren't using it already, please give it a shot. The address distribution problem for IPv6 needs to be solved separately, but for NATed routes, it works beautifully. Second piece, HMAC authentication is also very helpful in the case of an attacker against the network. You can at least begin to secure your routers against someone deciding arbitrarily to announce 8.8.8 .8 or a default route if you use that. The third one is my network with 1.9 finally ready. I could use some help in California and climbing some trees. If anybody would like some free housing and a yurt to stay in, I'll c contact me later. Thanks. 
Do you also have some kind of like key management uh, in mind uh, to use HMAC or whatever, or you just put in there the the place for signature and? Okay. Do you it. want the official version or the truth? Both. Um. Okay. <laughs> the official version is that HMAC is a simple protocol that does symmetric keying, static symmetric keying only. And that if you need anything more, you should use Babel over DTLS. Okay? And the reason I'm saying that, and I'm being very clear in public that this is the case, is that I wanted to get published. It's been four years of my life, and I just, I, I'm not sure I will ever finish if it doesn't finish. In truth, we don't know. So the protocol is designed so that it supports multiple keys that you can do automate, so that you can do automated key rotation. And I don't know yet whether it is suitable for having a uh, key rotation mechanism or perhaps some Diffie-Hellman style key negotiation mechanism within it. And how much, how far do we want to go in that direction? My opinion is that this should be done outside of the Babel protocol, that you should have a different key exchange mechanism and not do it in line, in band within the protocol. But we haven't experimented with that yet. Do you want me to send? Do you want to send me an interns? No. Do you uh, <laughs> and do, are you familiar with what Axel did with the uh, Samtor? With Sa Axel Neumann, you know him, the, the guy that develops BMX. Yeah. Then, then he has a new version of BMX that is called well BMX Seven, I think, mm -hmm. with support for something that is called Samtor, which includes also a key negotiation algorithm that within the protocol. Yeah. So uh, I haven't seen BMX 7. I've spoken extensively about version 6 with Axel. And uh, my opinion is that what he's doing is extremely smart. He's really extremely smart. There are a few ideas that I really found very, very interesting in what he's doing. But I think that he's overloading the protocol. There is one property that people tend to neglect, which I think is very important. You cannot speak of doing free software if you don't have this property. We always neglect implementability of our protocols. Implementability is a very, very important property. I mean, we claim that we want to be using free software and that it's important for us to use free software. Well, if this software is so complicated that nobody can understand it, then the fact that you have the source code doesn't help you much. Okay? And the property that Babel can be implemented by a genius in two months, and by a different genius in two days, and by a different genius in five days, is a property that I deeply care about, and that I'm not going to break. So key management is not something that I would like to see within the Babel protocol. Uh, one important point, there is no negotiation in Babel. There is no negotiation. Okay, so once you try doing key exchange without doing any negotiation, it becomes very difficult. Uh, in the matrix room, a uh, user Subbab asks, uh, does Babel support MIMO radios for diversity routing now? Um. Okay, I deleted those slides from my talk at the, right, at the last point. So, Babel supports... So, one thing that we've experimented with is a very interesting metric due to Benjamin Henrion, who should be here tomorrow. Pseudonym and IRC is Zubab, for those who know yeah. him. That's his question. So it was originally his idea that Babel should be able to choose routes, not only depending on packet loss, but also on whether they self-interfere, whether they use the same frequency, radio frequency, multiple times. And I implemented his idea, and I spent way too long trying to show that it works. And I never managed to show that it works. I never managed to build a reproducible experiment 
for it works. So basically, you put down routers. I'm not speaking about simulation. I'm not speaking about mathematics here. I'm speaking about actually testing it with actual Wi-Fi routers. And so you lay down your routers, and then it's 4 a.m., and you are able to show that it's perhaps a little bit better than normal babble. And then 7 a.m. arrives, and suddenly there is no difference because your neighbors are using their Wi-Fi and the amount of external interference completely drowns the tiny, tiny difference that you can measure. So either I did something wrong or this is a very good idea that turns out not to be useful in practice. So it is supported, but we are not using it because we never managed to show that it's useful. Thank you.